Ethrin? Yes. I, be I believe the meeting organizer, if that's Haley, can record. Yes, and I, I didn't ask her to. That was what I was saying, but I think it would be good if she did. Okay. I'm, I'm yeah. not recording. I was just emailing you. I, I heard you say that, and I turned on the recording feature. Okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you. So if, if I get dropped, then I, I thank you. Wonderful suggestion. Yes. We're all, we're all on, and it's 3 o'clock. So, Haley, is there anyone else we're expecting? I think we have a nice little group here. Can sure. we... A few more we were expecting, but some indicated that they'd be hopping on a little late, but they'll be muted as they come on. So if, if they're okay. muted, they, they should be able to hear everything still. So. Okay. All right. Well, you know me and the time thing. So let's unmute. If you don't mind, Kaylee, if we can unmute everybody. I can unmute myself. I think everyone is unmuted. <laughs> Everybody here? Hear me? I'm here. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> yes. Kate's on her way to Michigan, but she's with us. And we're going to expect a few more people, and Haley is going to be monitoring, monitoring them. So I just want to say good afternoon and welcome to everybody to the Civic Education Committee of the Women for Change organization for the program and presentation by Dr. Janet McCabe, The World We All Share. I'm Katherine Tyler Scott, and I'm the chair of the committee. And as you all know, Women for Change Indiana is a not-for-profit organization whose mission is to educate, equip, and mobilize Hoosiers to create positive change for women. The members of the committee are Kate Appel, Terry Bowman, Sheila Cease Kennedy, Sharon Miller, and Ava Taylor. We provide educational workshops and resources, and we host these conversational groups that teach participants about the origins and structure of our form of governance and government, focusing particularly on the Constitution, and we help them to develop skills that enable civil dialogue on potentially divisive issues. Honest, objective, and informed political debates are all too rare in today's polarized climate superheated and hyperpartisan rhetoric and the public's spotty knowledge about our political system all undermine informed and considered responses to policy debates. That sentence comes from one of our committee members, Sheila Cease Kennedy, and our charge includes getting rid of some of those spotty uh, knowledge uh, openings about our political system. And so, we have selected four issues of focus for this year's conversations, which we hope you are part of or will be hosting. And the four issues are income inequality, voter education and registration, healthcare and environmental justice, which is going to be the focus of our conversation today. Before I introduce our presenter, I want to go over the few items for conducting our uh, Zoom conversation. And we're going to ask you to, first of all, be sure and mute yourself when you are not speaking through the computer because we can hear everything, you know, chain and conversation and dogs barking and kids singing and whatever, uh, all those things that go on so we can all hear. And Haley uh, Bauer, who's the Director of Education and Advocacy for the Women for Change, is going to be monitoring the chat and the Q&A features on the Zoom. Yeah. yeah, so she'll be keeping track of anything that you're saying or need to talk about so that at the end of the presentation, she can uh, call on you to ask your questions of our speaker. So we ask that you do that. And if there are no other questions or any concerns, I would like to introduce our speaker and presenter, Dr. Janet McCabe, who's gonna be talking about the world we all share. Janet is currently the professor of practice at the Indiana University McKinney School of Law and the director of the IU Environmental Resilience Institute, where she started as assistant director for policy and implementation in 2017. And prior to this, she was principal deputy to the assistant administrator of the Office of Air and Radiation before being nominated by President Barack Obama as the acting assistant administrator for this office, a position she held for four years before returning to Indiana. Before even joining the EPA, she was the Executive Director of Improving Kids Environment, Inc., 
a children's environmental health advocacy organization based in Indianapolis, Indiana. I wish I'd known about that organization. She also was an adjunct faculty member at the Indiana University School of Medicine, Department of Public Health, and at the School of Public and Environmental Affairs. Her Hoosier connection dates back to 1993 when she held several major leadership positions in the Indiana Department of Environmental Management's office, that's a mouthful, of air quality, and served as assistant commissioner of this office from 1998 to 2005. Before she even arrived in Indiana in 1993, she served as assistant attorney general for environmental protection for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and assistant secretary for environmental impact review. She grew up in Washington, DC and graduated from Harvard in 1980 and Harvard Law School in 1983. We are delighted to have someone of her knowledge and expertise uh, joining us today and informing us about this issue that we all need to know about. Please join me in welcoming Janet McKay. Janet, thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I, I can't tell you how delighted I was to um, get this invitation. Um, uh, there's, there are few things I like more than talking to people about the Clean Air Act and our environmental system in the United States and climate change um, and the ways we can all get involved. And I just knew that this would be um, such a friendly audience. Um, and uh, plus, I admire so much the effort that you have underway here um, to bring people together to learn and to, and to talk about how we how we deal with these really hard issues in a constructive and civilized manner, which um, seems to be so far out of our reach these days um, for so many people and in so many settings. Um, I'm thrilled to see a couple of names and faces that I recognize um, in this group. Um, I won't reveal who those people are, um, but I'm uh, but also um, pleased to uh, uh, Zoom meet um, all, all the rest of you. Um, I, I could talk about these issues for pretty much ever. Um, and as Catherine and I were talking about how to, what to focus on in this presentation, um, it's sort of necessarily at kind of a high level. Um, and um, I hope that that will not, you will not feel um, uh, patronized or condescended to by me. Um, I certainly don't intend to be telling you things that you already know. Um, but I wanted to give an overview, and I would be happy to go into more depth um, on any particular issue that, that you are interested in. Um, so um, I am going to share my screen here. And you can let me know, or is, is that all good? You can see the presentation? Okay, um, so uh, I see one person watching from a car. Um, bravo, you! Um, and <laughs> I, I, I love your I love your name, dog in the car. Um, so uh, I, can you see the the slides on your tiny little screen? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I All right. Great. Because um, I apologies, but this is as close as I could get to home. So no, I no, <laughs> no. And I you seem to be stopped, so that's safe. We're good. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the first few slides I'm going to go through um, fairly quickly, and there are a lot of pictures. That's why I wanted to ask. So um, I, I'm planning to talk about th three things today, um, give a little bit of an overview of, of how, how we all started in, with the environmental movement in Indiana, or in, in America, um, and, uh, and, and how, what all the pieces are. Um, because uh, there's no reason that people would know those things if they haven't spent their life um, working in them um, the way I have and, and, and some others have. Um, I want to talk about um, some successes that we've had because in the environmental um, arena, we've had some major successes in this country and people need to know that. Uh, because these problems are solvable, and they have been solved in the past um, uh, with, with tremendous benefits for um, public health and the environment um, and other uh, considerations in the United States. But we also have many, many challenges that remain, and we'll, we'll talk about those. Um, and then uh, at the end, I, I want to be sure to talk about uh, what we can all do, how we can all engage uh, with these issues, because um, particularly when it comes to climate change, um, first of all, this is not an issue that's going to fix itself. Um, and it is also one where we sort of trade off between thinking, is this something that individuals have to do by recycling their soda cans one at a time? Um, or is it um, rather things that governments need to do 
um, and it doesn't matter what individuals do, um, and yet the governments never seem to be able to get themselves organized to do something meaningful. Um, and what I'm going to um, argue is that it really is both and that, and that they are interrelated. And if the, we don't have people recycling their soda cans, they will not be informed enough to make sure that people uh, who get into positions of decision-making power are making the decisions that those people want them to make about the environment. So, um, so let's start with a little bit of background. So um, these are, uh, uh, this is the way we used to live in Indiana. And if you go to Connor Prairie, it kind of looks like this now, uh, pre-industrial. Um, but then um, clever humans um, got to inventing things um, and somebody invented the steam engine um, and somebody invented the automobile. This is, I think, a very, very early version of um, a BMW, um, sort of charming looking. Um, and somebody invented the cotton gin, um, uh, Eli Whitney, um, which could be uh, cranked by hand, but uh, and then could be cranked by horse, and then could be cranked by um, by energy, by um, chemical energy. Um, so uh, we were off and running in the industrial age, um, and uh, what that has delivered to us is an economy that is um, entirely dependent on using energy. And most of that energy comes from fossil fuels. Um, that is basically energy stored in the ground in the form of coal or oil or natural gas um, that we use for our very motor vehicle dependent society and our very electricity dependent society. Um, this is a picture of um, one of the biggest coal-fired power plants in the country. It's called the Navajo Generating Station. Um, and it's out in the uh, northeast corner, I believe, of Arizona. It is gargantuan. Um, and, uh, but we have hundreds of them across the country. Um, and these power plants are um, helping to run these uh, computers that we're on now and the lights and, and, and everything we have, and you know that. Um, but um, over the last um, couple hundred years, um, this is what um, many societies around the world have come to depend on. Um, with the use of these fuels um, comes significant um, uh, pollution, um, which is kind of a loaded word because pollution is a bad, bad word, um, but emissions. Uh, uh, emissions um, and also destruction of natural landscapes in order to extract um, these uh, uh, materials out of the ground um, and then emissions associated with processing them and moving them around to the places where they need to be uh, burned or, or consumed. Um, so there are lots of um, associated impacts that come along with all um, the incredibly positive benefits about our being able to have lights and um, have ambulances that get people to the hospital where there's an operating room with power and, and all those sorts of things that we know are, are wise. So um, people started um, uh, noticing things that were happening in the environment. And I'm going to put up four pictures here. Um, and uh, we could play a little bingo. Um, does anybody, if you could stick in the chat room, um, if you know who any of these people are. Um, let's start with this one. Or you could just, you could just unmute yourself and say, uh, do people know who this, this person is? Sharon just said. Okay. Sharon said it, 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 is, it is Rachel Carson, um, who wrote Silent Spring. Um, she understood, she studied the ocean and animals and birds and, um, and realized that the pesticide DDT um, was um, uh, 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 getting into the systems of uh, birds and causing their eggshells to be um, so thin that, the, uh, that they, they, the baby birds couldn't hatch. And um, it led to, at great personal cost, because she was um, uh, basically vilified, um, that uh, an understanding of how chemicals in the, in the environment um, have indirect consequences that are sometimes very hard to see. Um, anybody know who, who this person is? Mm -hmm. She's my favorite on this page, I think. This is um, Jean Stratton Porter. Oh, and she, she, yeah. And she is um, the, the Hoosier version of Rachel Carson. 
Um, she lived in Northeast Indiana. She was a self-taught naturalist, photographer, artist, you name it. Uh, she became incredibly wealthy. Um, she wrote a whole series of sort of treacly, very didactic novels um, that were all a vehicle um, for people to understand how important the natural world was. And if you've ever heard of the Limberlost Swamp, Mm -hmm. um, that's where she lived, and she has a she wrote books about that. Um, she, an amazing person. She she had her flaws. Um, uh, I I can assure you, but um, but that's that's who she is. Um, wrote freckles exactly. Um, uh, how about this person? Um, I think probably people will recognize okay. that person. Um, yep, um, uh, that's Teddy Roosevelt. So um, I have him on here because uh, when he was president, um, that's when our national park system um, uh, really got going. And um, uh, we're so lucky in this country to have, have that. I could have put John Muir on here. In fact, I had him on an earlier slide. And this last one, any guesses on this last one? He's got a prop to sort of give him away. Yep, Ansel Adams. So I put him on here because um, uh, the, the influence of uh, people seeing these incredible landscapes is one way that people can understand how important these resources are for us. Okay, uh, now let me, there we go. Um, so we had some people who were starting to um, uh, uh, draw attention to what was going on in the environment. Um, we also had some things going on in the environment that were just absolutely inescapable. And so I'll show you some kind of scary pictures. Um, litter on the beach, um, including medical waste, what became a huge issue. Um, uh, buried or not buried, rusty drums um, that held God knows what um, in them um, uh, was not uncommon. Um, this is a picture of the Cuyahoga River in Ohio catching fire. Um, which it did a couple of times because of the, um, uh, the uh, flammable um, materials, the oil and stuff that was on the surface of the water. That was pretty dramatic. Um, and this is a, a scene from uh, Los Angeles. Uh, we actually had cities in the United States that looked like this, um, mm -hmm. that were just so choked with pollution that people couldn't see from one side to the other. Um, all of these um, situations are not only heartbreaking to look at, but they all have significant potential public health um, uh, adverse impacts, right? Uh, whether they're obvious, like you can't breathe here, um, and if you have asthma, you better stay inside, um, to uh, what's in these barrels and are they getting into my groundwater? Um, and are my children wandering into the woods to play here? Um, so uh, these were very dramatic. We don't see these kinds of things quite so much anymore, but, um, but we did in this country. In 1968, um, uh, Apollo 8 circled, was the first manned person um, uh, rocket to go around the capsule, to go around the moon. And they took this photograph, which is called Earthrise. Um, it was the first time that people had seen um, this incredible planet that we live on from this perspective and it is so beautiful and it's so hanging out there all by itself and seems so fragile and it really helped to contribute to a change in attitude about um, uh, the way people looked at the earth. Um, so two years later, Gaylord Nelson, who was a senator from Wisconsin, um, uh, organized something called the first Earth Day and it turned into a massive, massive um, celebration, protest, demonstration, awakening of people's attitudes um, about, um, uh, about the earth. Um, literally millions, and, and he himself was, was really staggered. Um, so this was uh, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day this year, and had we not had COVID, um, there would have been um, very big celebrations. Um, it turns out that, uh, that Gaylord Nelson was actually in Bloomington, Indiana, on the first Earth Day in 1970. I think he, I think he hopped around to five or six different places, but he, he gave a speech um, on Dun Meadow in Bloomington um, to a crowd, not as big as this, but um, a, a big crowd of people. And apparently it was quite a barn burner. There's a, there's a tape of it, which I haven't had a chance to listen to, but um, hopefully we'll be able to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day in, in an appropriate style. Um, you started seeing things like this, um, really an awareness of Mother Earth and how um, she 
takes care of us and we depend on her um, and um, and things that look like protests um, with signs and, and all that sort of thing um, and people joining uh, the movement. So um, that um, um, really launched um, or was one of the the things that was coincident with um, a significant step up in um, attention to environmental matters from um, the, the US government. So in 1970, um, when uh, Richard Nixon was president, he created um, the US Environmental Protection Agency. Um, interestingly, um, uh, a lot of the major environmental legislation in this country uh, was actually uh, signed by Republican presidents. Um, and there's all kinds of stories around, around that. Um, but Nixon um, uh, founded the, the US EPA. And here's another 20 questions. Anybody know who this gentleman is he, he was the first administrator of the US EPA. Ruckelshaus. Ruckelshaus, yeah. uh, Bill Ruckelshaus, um, great Hoosier, um, who just passed away um, recently at um, a very, very um, uh, elderly and incredibly accomplished person. Um, I, I think probably more people know him for his role, um, his uh, courageous Better. role in the Watergate scandal. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he is um, among EPA career staff, um, and there's some there still who work for him. Um, he is, um, he is a, a complete hero. Here he is again um, with Nixon signing um, one of these bills. I'm not sure which one it is. But um, in the 70s, um, we saw the enactment of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, which actually came first. And, and it's a statute that, um, that requires federal agencies to pay attention to environmental impacts of their projects. Um, so when the Federal Highway Authority is building a new interstate, um, or when, um, um, oh gosh, what's, what's another example? When, uh, when uh, the Department of Energy is trying to site a, a place for nuclear waste, um, that they have to do a big environmental impact study and actually look at alternatives and ways to mitigate environmental impacts. The Safe Drinking Water Act, um, the Superfund Act, which is um, the act that helps us have sort of an insurance um, fund to pay for cleanups of hazardous waste sites. And the, uh, the resource, I'm sorry, I, I tried not to use acronyms, but the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, which uh, mostly has, is about a thousand different rules about how you are supposed to handle hazardous materials and hazardous waste when you use them in your, in your business. Um, so all of these came, came marching along in the 70s, um, along with a lot of infrastructure and bureaucracy um, of, of, and money um, of how to implement them. So um, I wanted to just um, explain a little bit, um, uh, not that you need a lesson on civics, but just as it relates to the environmental world. So we start with statutes uh, like the Clean Air Act um, that uh, set out broad goals mostly. Um, they get specific in some cases, but mostly broad goals. Um, and, uh, and, and Congress, um, our elected representatives in Congress uh, pass those laws. Um, they, those laws that get, then get handed off um, to various agencies for the environmental rules, it's mostly the US EPA, although not only the US EPA. Um, and th through the development of regulations, uh, policies, programs, um, it's not all regulations, but a lot of it is. Um, and other, the president can issue executive orders, um, as I'm sure you've heard about um, recently. Um, every president does them. Um, and it's federal agencies like EPA or the Department of Energy, the Department of Transportation, um, and then the White House, um, the White House being the boss of, um, ultimately, of uh, agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, we then, um, it, through most of our environmental statutes, um, people can uh, go to court if they feel that the government is not actually uh, implementing or enforcing those laws. So uh, we have all three branches of government involved in this environmental enterprise. And then we have um, the states because um, the federal government, there's no way that the federal government all by itself could implement, police, and enforce um, all of these environmental programs. There just would never be enough federal employees to do that. And if you just think about 
um, the, what happens in a state like Indiana where new factories or expanding factories have to get permits for water discharges or air discharges. Uh, they need to have inspections by people who know what they're doing. Um, uh, there need to be education programs. There, need to, there needs to be tracking of emissions and reports and all that sort of thing. EPA can't do that for 50 states and the, the territories. Um, so there has for a long time been a, a very clear partnership between state environmental agencies and EPA. Um, and in fact, the environmental laws that came at the federal level kind of came plopped down on top of whatever the states were doing already. So um, it really made sense to have a partnership. And um, the Clean Air Act, the one I'm most familiar with, is very clear. There are certain things that it makes sense for the federal government to do, and there are certain things that it makes sense for the state government to do. Um, places where we want to have national expectations, like our air quality standards. We want the air to be just as clean, just as healthful in Indiana as it is in Florida or North Dakota or New York, right? Um, uh, so EPA sets those kinds of national standards, but then it's up to agencies like IDEM, where I spent a bunch of time in the air program, to actually issue the permits and do the inspections and, and write rules that are specific to Indiana. Um, I actually think it's a, a, a pretty terrific system. Um, so um, I mentioned before that it, this is not all done by regulations. Uh, sometimes I think, depending on the news that you hear, um, it, it makes it sound like um, agencies like EPA or IDEM are just regulation machines and they're just, that's all they can do is tell people what to do. Uh, but in fact, we accomplish our environmental protection in this country through many, many different types of activities. Um, research. So uh, the biggest office at EPA is the Office of Research and Development. Um, it's bigger than any other single office. And what they do is um, uh, figure out um, important research to do on environmental and public health issues. And they do some themselves. They collaborate with other agencies. They fund scientists at universities and other institutions around the country. Um, and we make a huge lot of progress in this country um, on, on federally funded research. Um, EPA also does a lot of data collection. Um, uh, there, there are certainly issues where um, EPA, with its higher level of expertise and deeper pockets um, than an agency like IDEM, uh, has the ability to uh, develop data tracking and data collection systems um, that can benefit the whole country, and then the individual states don't have to do it. Um, EPA is involved in numerous partnership programs um, uh, with other governments, um, other governmental agencies, with, um, with countries around the world. Um, uh, and uh, there's a lot of international diplomacy that goes on because uh, many environmental problems, um, including um, climate change, are not uh, just domestic. Um, EPA, through Congress, when Congress gives its money, um, can run grant programs to help with local projects, with state projects. Um, uh, it has lots of uh, policies that it implements internally um, on things like scientific integrity. How do we do our, our science? How do we make sure that rules and policies are based on actual science? Um, uh, how do we uh, judge the costs and the benefits of various things? Um, and then, of course, there are regulations. And under the Clean Air Act, uh, there are many, many regulations that, that Congress has required EPA to develop. Um, the, the, and then I mentioned the implementation of programs, um, which is done both at the federal and state level. Um, so um, I realize I'm going to have to pick it up here. So um, I wanted to tell you about five things that five issues where we have really made a big uh, difference in this country. Um, the first one is lead poisoning in children, um, super serious issue. It has not gone away, but uh, when I was a child, the key issue um, for lead exposure was lead and gasoline. And what you're seeing here is a picture of what happened to blood lead levels in children once lead was no longer allowed to be included in gasoline. Um, look at that massive um, uh, decrease. And you can see here that there is a racial disparity in who gets affected by lead poisoning. So we have not fixed this by any means. And there, there are hundreds of children in Indiana that get poisoned every year, mostly now through the paint in their houses or the, um, the lead in, their, in the dust in their, in their yards. Um, but it's way better than it was. And that was a technological innovation and a regulation that made that happen. 
Um, this is a graph that shows how much cleaner cars are uh, than they were in 1980. Isn't that massive? Uh, this is because of catalytic converters and per particulate traps and cleaner gasoline, um, just hugely impactful. This is a picture of, um, if you remember hearing about the hole in the ozone layer. So ozone at ground level is an air pollutant. It, it's, it's harmful to people's lungs, um, but we need it up in the stratosphere to keep um, the uh, radiation from the sun from getting down to earth level and uh, creating a lot of skin cancer and cataracts. And scientists were noticing that the ozone was thinning at, uh, in the um, Arctic. And it was as a result of chemicals that were used in aerosols. Um, so if you remember that people used to use hairsprays and deodorants and, and things that had aerosols in them, um, there are also chemicals used in air conditioning, um, coolants, refrigerants. Um, and so all the countries in the entire world got together and established something called the, the um, uh, the Montreal Protocol that called for elimination and reduction of those chemicals. Um, and that's been successful. And the hole in the ozone layer is, um, is recovering. It's not all the way there yet, but that's another one. Um, and plenty of companies made a lot of money out of uh, inventing and marketing these new chemicals, um, including American companies. Um, number four, acid rain. Um, so in the 80s and 90s, um, people were noticing that the forests in, in the Northeast um, were dying and the, um, the uh, fish and, and, um, and amphibians uh, were, uh, were not doing well. Um, and it was because there was too much sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides um, that were coming from coal-fired electricity production, um, of which the Midwest uh, was a huge source. So when I was working for Massachusetts in Massachusetts, um, I was part of lawsuits uh, uh, suing Ohio and Indiana and, and West Virginia uh, because of the pollution that was coming over the borders um, to harm the forests in Massachusetts. Um, through the use of technology like, um, like scrubbers on power plants and um, the, over time the reduction in the dependence on um, coal, especially high sulfur coal, um, you can see now um, how much better that situation is. This is a problem that people thought would bring the economy to its knees back then, um, and yet it was done. And so our little friend, the American toad, is happy. Um, the last example I want to tell you about um, is something that we, uh, that we refer to as regional haze. Um, so in the Great Smoky Mountains, they're called that because there's natural um, haze there, at least some. Um, but we also have an issue of air pollution in our most pristine areas in, in the country, uh, uh, Grand Canyon National Park, um, the, uh, um, uh, the one up in Maine that I, keep, that I forget the name of, um, uh, that's you know, at the end of everywhere, and yet it has pollution. Um, and so the Clean Air Act said, uh, you have to fix that. And a lot of the pollution that was causing the regional haze was the same as was causing acid rain. And um, so as these power plants got cleaner and cleaner, our skies started getting cleaner too. Um, and so here's a beautiful sunny day on our new national park, Mount Baldy in Northwest Indiana, Bravo. We finally have a national park um, in Indiana. Um, and that's a result of um, re reductions in air pollution um, that have been uh, the, the result of um, Acadia. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, uh, um, the result of the Clean Air Act. So we can do these things. And uh, another thing that you can see from, uh, from these pictures is that oftentimes we can, we can solve more than one problem uh, with the same kind of solution. So when we reduce our reliance on coal or we put control technology on coal-fired power plants, we improve acid rain, we also improve visibility, we also have ozone and smog and soot in our cities um, and, and public health. Let's see if I can move on here. Um, this is a chart that EPA keeps track of all the time. It's really interesting. We, we call it the baby chart. We called it the baby chart um, because of this little guy who's probably 50 now, right? Um, but this is a chart that shows how for all of these indications of economic activity, gross domestic product, how much are we driving, how many people do we have, how much energy are we using, they've all gone up since 1980. All of them have gone up except for one. 
Um, and when you look at the combined level of air pollution in this country over the same period of time, it has gone down 71%. So this is an important chart because it, it, it shows that we really don't have to choose between a strong economy and a healthy environment, which is often the way you hear people um, uh, talk about it. The one uh, pollutant that is uh, higher than what it was in 1980 is uh, greenhouse gases. Um, it's this purple line here, 15% higher. You can see even it's gone down some, but, um, but it is not, it's gone up, it's not gone down. Um, uh, green, CO2 emissions are directly tied to economic activity. Um, uh, in terms of when, uh, when our economy is doing well, our power plants are running more and people are driving more, and so we have more CO2. We'll talk about that a lot more here. Um, there are a number, so we've taken care of some of our issues, but we have many environmental problems remaining. Um, pesticide use in agriculture, water quality, just think of Flint, um, or, or many people who have compromised water systems. Um, we, power plant emissions are still an issue. Um, the development of natural gas, um, where a lot of it is actually burned off and flared. Air pollution and water pollution there. Um, motor vehicles, look at this lovely thing. You would not wanna be breathing behind that guy. Um, uh, mercury and other contaminants in our waterways that get into our fish. Um, environmental justice. This is a real life picture of uh, where these children live and play. And I could have shown you many more of um, uh, housing developments that are right on the fence line of chemical plants, of power plants, um, and uh, mostly those are communities of poor people and communities of color. Um, and um, here's a dramatic one. This is Lake Erie, um, an algal bloom. Um, in Lake Erie, which shut down the water supply of Toledo for several days. Um, this is toxic algae that's created by um, too many nutrients in the water from agricultural runoff. Um, when it comes to climate change, I wanna show you a couple of key graphs um, that um, uh, are very dramatic, I think. Um, so um, for many decades, uh, uh, a, um, a monitoring station um, at the top of a mountain in um, Hawaii has been measuring CO2 in the atmosphere, um, and it has been going up. Um, you see how the, the line is sort of jagged? Um, that shows that over the course of a single year, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere goes up and down, and here's why. It's like the earth is breathing. Um, you know that People breathe out carbon dioxide and so do power plants and cars. Trees and plants breathe it in. So in the spring and summer, when there's a lot of green things growing, there is carbon dioxide drawn in from the atmosphere and that, that will, sh will show as a little dip. And then when there aren't leaves on the trees, there isn't that, it's called a carbon sink. There isn't that carbon sink and so it's higher. But overall, it has gone up dramatically. Um, also, what's gone up uh, dramatically is emissions of carbon dioxide over this period of time. So this is from power plants and cars and, and all that sort of thing. Um, and here is a, a chart that shows temperature um, and CO2 emissions. Um, so um, it's a pretty dramatic correlation between the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere um, and the temperatures um, on the Earth. Climate change is um, uh, clearly impacting um, uh, many things around the world. Uh, we are having more and more intense wildfires because temperatures are hotter, the ground is drier. Um, uh, I, I just learned an interesting thing from somebody the other day that it used to be that, that California and Australia had, had different fire seasons. And so they actually could share this really expensive, sophisticated firefighting equipment. But they can't do that anymore because now both California and Australia basically have fire season all the time. Oh. So, so a very sort of dramatic thing. If you live on the coast, um, there is coastal flooding um, and, um, and uh, very problematic and scary. Um, uh, hydrologists say that People never care about water unless there's too much or too little. Um, we have many areas where there's drought. Um, uh, this is a picture of a coral reef um, that is dying. I don't know about you, but I can barely stand to look at these, at these pictures of these resources that are, um, that are dying away. 
um, uh, we're having flood flooding even inland. And of course, we're seeing that in Indiana um, more in intensively. Um, and the last two are, you know, our little friends um, who uh, bother us and make us sick sometimes as, as temperatures change, habitats change, and we're seeing more ticks um, coming into Indiana, for example, um, that bear disease, and uh, likewise with mosquitoes. Um, there are many, many impacts of climate change on, on public health and the environment. Um, those are just sort of the dramatic ones. Um, EPA gathers a lot of facts about climate change. This is a very, very busy slide. And, and Catherine, I'm, uh, you know, I've already sent these slides to um, Haley. Um, feel free to share them um, with folks. Um, so I'm not going to go over this, but um, my point is that um, uh, greenhouse gases come from a lot of different parts of our economy. Um, it's sort of, you can sort of think of it, a third is motor vehicles, and a third is power generation, and then a third is everything else. Um, uh, it's a lot of emissions, um, and uh, um, there we're just one country that that is um, sharing these emissions. Um, this shows um, just so you can see where those areas are in our economy that greenhouse gases come from, and you can see the most dramatic line there really is uh, is the electric power industry, uh, which really has been reducing in recent years. Um, this is due in large part to um, the reduction in the use of coal. Um, and uh, the reason, there are many reasons why um, less coal is being burned now, uh, but primarily coal has become less competitive with other forms of energy. It just, it, it costs more, oops, how did that happen? Um, it costs more to get coal out of the ground um, and then it does to get natural gas out of the ground and increasingly solar and wind energy are becoming cheaper. And, and one thing that, that, it, you know, that really makes sense, right? With solar energy and wind energy, the cost for the fuel is zero, right? So once you get the infrastructure built and you have the distribution system working, um, then you don't have ongoing fuel costs, which is, which is amazing. Um, we don't have widgets. We don't have catalytic converters or, or traps that you can put onto um, a smokestack or a tailpipe that will grab the CO2. Um, but we do have things like, um, like alter renewable energy. We have electric cars that people are, um, are um, increasingly uh, driving. Um, uh, it's gonna be, take a lot of ingenuity to figure out um, the, the, the best ways to reduce CO2. Um, all the way through our economy. Um, uh, these are a couple of the programs that I worked on while I was at EPA that were specifically addressed at reducing CO2. Um, and um, all of these um, programs are now um, either being revised or on hold, uh, not going forward under the current administration, which um, I'm not going to get political here, but um, they've been very clear that climate change is not a priority for them and getting rid of regulations is a priority for them. Um, and so um, uh, these programs are, are not moving forward. Um, but um, there are things going on. So there are cities around the world um, and even here in Indiana um, that are standing up and saying, we're going to do this. There are also cities that are just concerned about the flooding that they're having and how much hotter it's going to get and how are they going to manage keeping their people safe and making sure that their roads don't wash out in the floods and that they don't have potholes all the time from the freezing and thawing. And um, at, uh, at IU, I work with a lot of cities around Indiana that, that are working on these things. Um, businesses are stepping up and um, our poster child is Cummins, um, which is a very forward looking company. They operate um, internationally um, and they are a very good environmental corporate citizen. They just announced a big new aggressive uh, climate change um, um, uh, uh, program. We have clean energy being built here in Indiana and elsewhere. Um, we have uh, electric school buses and electric cars. Um, uh, not every story is a great one. You know, we didn't have a good experience with the uh, Indy blue cars here, and th there's all kinds of reasons probably why that's the case. Um, but these things take a long time. Just think how long it took. People used to get around by horse and carriage, and then it took a long time for us to get used to cars, and we've had them for 100 years now. So it's going to take a while for us to transition um, to new forms of transportation. Um, and of course, the, the public 
um, is, uh, is very aware um, and getting more aware. Um, I love signs at protests. I don't know about you, but people are so clever. Um, and I love, this is one of my favorites. Got the plague? Me neither. Thank you, science. Um, uh, uh, people, and some of them are unprintable actually, but um, equally um, funny. Um, I wanted to, uh, to, to, to move into just making sure you knew about some of the things that are going on here in Indiana. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to be too parochial here, but I work at a place called the Environmental Resilience Institute at IU. It's been around since 2017. Um, and we work there to, um, on research, on solutions, and on communication around climate change and resilience to help Hoosiers um, uh, be better um, able to reduce and deal with climate change. Um, the big part that I do is taking all these things that my smart colleagues um, at IU do and actually getting them out into the real world through implementation activities. This is an incredibly important resource, the Indiana Climate Change Impacts Assessment, and it is organized out of the Purdue Climate Change Research Center, but it involves scientists from IU, Notre Dame, all over Indiana. Um, and these are individual chapters about the impacts of climate change on Indiana specifically. And we're very lucky to have this. Not all states have this kind of detailed information. Um, each of these chapters is, um, you know, stacks of peer reviewed complicated studies, but everyone also has a 10 to 12 page um, lay person oriented description. Um, very, very good resources if you're interested in reading more about this. Um, uh, I wanted to share this with you. This is just, this is one program that we do, um, and it's not even the biggest or the fanciest. But uh, we decided a couple of years ago that there are people all over Indiana actually doing amazing things to, pr to protect public health and the environment in their communities. And if there was one thing IU could do, we could lift them up and give them a little bit of attention. So we did the, our first group was last year. Um, some of you may know John Gibson. Um, he just passed away recently. Uh, but, but look at all these faces. And they're from academia, they're volunteers, they're older, they're younger, they're students, they're men, they're women. Um, it's just wonderful. And here's our group from this year. Um, and maybe you'll see a face in there um, that you recognize people who work in the faith community, um, farmer, um, uh, it's just, it, that, this, it just warms my heart so much um, that we have so many people working so hard in Indiana. Um, we also support environmental journalism. Um, so um, you may have heard Rebecca Thiel on WFYI. If you listen to WFYI, she's report, supported by IU. Um, the way journalism is going these days, um, uh, media rarely has money to hire experts um, for things like environmental reporting. And so you're finding academia or philanthropy are supporting these activities. Um, the Nina Mason Pulliam Trust supports the two reporters at the Indianapolis Star who work on environmental stories. And as a result, we have way more environmental content in the star than we used to. Uh, we run this fun little po podcast. If you like podcasts and want a new one to listen to, um, I'm part of the on-air talent for this, um, which is uh, really fun for me. Um, and then we also um, produce a, um, additional uh, journalism, environmental journalism in this thing, which is sort of operates like a little AP service, Associated Press service. Um, any news outlet anywhere can just take these stories and run them as long as they give attribution to um, Indiana University. It's, it's great. Um, I wanted to just mention something about, um, about viruses and COVID. So, um, because there is a connection to climate change. Um, and I am not a person that wants to make everything about climate change. Um, uh, so I sort of came to this a little bit more slowly than some people did. But uh, we are seeing an increase in the, around the globe of what are known as zoonotic diseases. This are, these are diseases that are passed from animals to humans. And one of the reasons that is so is because we are limiting or destroying the natural habitat for these animals, and they are then coming into closer contact with humans. So this is one example of how you have flooding you have an increase in mosquitoes. This is actually, we're creating habitat for mosquitoes. Um, and the mosquitoes then um, uh, can infect people directly, can infect animals that we then consume. And so uh, there is a connection here. And um, uh, we're thinking hard about how to bring these things together in ways that will 
um, uh, make progress in both areas. Um, we don't want to just uh, knock COVID-19 out with a vaccine or whatever and go back to the way we were doing things before because there will be COVID-20 and COVID-21 and, and, and the next thing, right? So I wanted to make that point. We have lots of uh, ways you can follow our information. Um, uh, it's easy to find us on the web and, and sign up for our newsletters if you're interested. Um, so wrapping up, um, what can we all do? Um, so I, um, I worked at IDEM for a while when uh, Joe Kernan was governor, um, who was just the loveliest person. Um, and, and one of the wonderful things I learned about him was that when he was mayor of South Bend, um, he, and he was walking around the town, he made it a point to pick up litter every day because that was his home, his city, and he wanted to keep it clean. So I do that. I pick up litter every day and I think of Joe Kernan. So there's so many things we can do um, in terms of um, uh, transportation, in terms of um, uh, uh, gardens. Um, a lot of these things involve kids, of course. Um, uh, um, I assume that none of you let the water run when you are um, brushing your teeth. Um, uh, riding the bus, um, uh, recycling, of course, um, and being efficient with electricity. I do wonder and worry that um, the reaction to COVID um, is going to undermine some progress we've made on some of these things. Um, people are going to be scared to get on a bus. Um, uh, uh, people are, um, are uh, getting a lot more takeout now, which is creating a lot more trash, which is not recyclable. Um, so uh, we, we have to be mindful of these things. And actually, I was washing my hands the other day, and I was thinking, people are letting the water run while they scrub their hands for while they sing happy birthday to you twice, right? So, um, so we need to educate people and people need to feel empowered to do these things. And I do think that even though we are not gonna fix the world, if I ride my bike to the CVS today instead of driving a car, every time I do that, it makes me think about these things more consciously and I will do other things. Um, there are other things that we can do uh, beyond those ones that uh, are so suitable to pictures. Uh, one is that we live in a democracy and we are all entitled to comment on government programs and proposals. Uh, and it's doable and we're all getting so nimble now with email and stuff that you, you can do these things. And I'd be happy to help anybody learn how to do it if, if you want to, how to find these things and how to comment on them. There are lots of organizations that help with that. Um, we can educate our elected officials um, and, and Women for Change is, you know, is all about that, right? Um, uh, we have to demand transparency. If we don't have transparency, we have no democracy. And um, uh, having been in government, I know how easy it is um, for stuff to get lost and to get buried either by accident or accidental on purpose or really on purpose. And um, so we need to be watchdogs for our own democracy. Um, uh, we, we, we need to be nice to federal employees, um, especially at EPA. This is a very, very hard time for them. Many of them have spent the last three years undoing the things that they spent their careers working on um, and uh, feeling that they were not carrying out the mission of the EPA. Um, but regardless, they are under tremendous pressure and they do work for government. They understand that. Um, so uh, we need to um, recognize um, that they are public servants and deserve respect and, and kindness. Um, we can support the organizations that are working on things we care about, and there are many in the environmental space. Um, uh, this is the biggest one. Um, we all need to get out there and vote for the people that, that, we, that we understand and believe will push for the policies that we care about. So uh, this is my last slide. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I hesitated using it because I think more and more um, people uh, are not questioning, not legitimately questioning the science behind um, environmental change and climate change. But, uh, but there is still sort of this thing out there that some people sort of question it. And so, okay, so what if we are wrong um, and we've still done these things? Um, we will have. Uh, more energy diversity. We will have uh, uh, healthier forests. We will have more livable cities. We will be healthier. Um, all these good things will come from this. So, um, and we won't stop our economy. So, um, so um, let's let's 
talk about those things in a positive way um, and, and see how we can move forward with them. Um, I feel like um, there are so many things I didn't talk to you about. I didn't talk to you about all the data that, that exists to show that um, communities of color are, are more at risk of um, adverse uh, birth outcomes. There was just a study about that yesterday, or asthma, or lead poisoning, um, or poor water quality. Um, that could be a whole nother session with me or somebody else who is um, smart about those things, um, but it's unquestionably true. Um, and uh, I could talk more about cars and I could talk more about power plants and I could talk more about the international situation. Um, so uh, if you are interested, um, please let me know. And if you think there are other groups that would be interested in hearing about these sorts of things, and if you're interested in learning more about what the Environmental Resilience Institute is doing, that's a whole other presentation that I'd be, be happy to share with you. So Catherine, I will turn yes. it back to you. Well, Jen, this has been incredibly informative, filled with incredible and valuable information and also issues that we need to be very concerned about and probably will be talking some more about. I know you also recommended a source to us, which we'll talk about later, to expand on your concern about environmental injustice. And my hope is that we will then get you back and that person back together for another conversation after we have her. But we can open it up now for questions, comments, and where's Haley? Were there any questions? I think we were spellbound with your presentation. I don't know if there were any questions left. Martha has a question. Oh, and then Martha and Sharon have questions. Martha put hers in the chat. It says, where can we find information on environmental impacts on women and minority women especially? Yeah, I saw that and I was just writing it down. Rather than scramble and try to put, throw some site up into the chat box, um, let me uh, be a little bit more deliberate and get um, some references um, and I'll get them back to Catherine or Haley and she can get them out to the group. Does that sound good? Sounds, sounds really good. And yeah. the person okay. that you recommended was Denise and her last name is Abdul Rahman or Raymond? Yes, Denise Abdul Rahman. Yes. She is the chair. environmental justice chair for the Indi Indiana NAACP. Exactly. And she has national networks as well and statewide networks. And she's going to probably be our next speaker. And then the two of you together would be absolutely great to have a continued conversation. I'd love to do that. Okay. So. Um, let's see. Somebody, Sharon asks, I've heard that petitions signed online are useless. Do they have any weight? That's a really good question. Um, so uh, when I was at EPA, um, there's an obligation of EPA to respond to any um, relevant comment that it gets in the course of a rulemaking. And if it fails to do that, that can be a procedural reason to throw the rule out. So we took that really seriously. Um, there, were, there were a couple kinds of comments that we would get. We would get um, um, comments from the industry would, that was affected or from environmental groups or scientists that would be hundreds of pages of very technical comments or legal comments or whatever, and we'd go through them, you know. And then we would get comments from citizens who would say, please, please pass this rule, I can't breathe. Or they would say, what are you crazy EPA? You've never met a regulation you didn't like, it's gonna kill jobs in my community, don't pass this regulation. Those are really important in, uh, inputs to the federal government. Um, they're very different in kind to the, to the technical ones. Um, I would say that petitions signed online are not useless. Um, it is important for decision makers to know when there are thousands and thousands of people who believe one thing or another. Um, it's, it's hard not to be um, more moved when you know somebody has taken time to actually write something themselves instead of just in these days, you know, you just push click and you've signed on. Um, but, uh, but nevertheless, um, for all the big rules, I would have groups come in and either hand me boxes of, of uh, postcards that people had signed or sometimes they'd hand me a thumb drive uh, with all that on there. So um, I wouldn't not do it, um, but I do think that it is more impactful if you can share a personal story about why this issue matters to you, um, or if you have actual information about that specific thing, um, 
uh, like, well, you know, you're proposing this, but I don't think that will work because my family business was dry cleaning and you, you know, you, you, you change out the chemicals more frequently than this presumes or something like that. If it's a factual thing like that, then the agency really has to, really has to pay attention to it and think about whether that should make a change in the rule. So it's kind of a hierarchy. Um, and then uh, somebody has asked about the municipal incinerator and whether subscription recycling programs are dumping in the incinerator. Um, I don't actually know the, the answer to the second um, question there, but I, I can tell you who to ask. Um, uh, we, um, we, we're blessed with an incinerator here in central Indiana. Um, I don't think there'll be another incinerator in, in the state ever, probably, um, that's very disfavored um, to, um, to burn trash. Um, uh, but it, it's, it is fairly well controlled, um, which, is, which is a good thing. Um, there are um, the recycling uh, markets really got affected when China, which was going to take them anymore. And so I know there has been a lot of um, angst about where those materials go. Um, where I would, um, I'll put this in the chat room, um, uh, the Indiana Recycling Coalition is a great place to get these questions answered. And the, the executive director is a lovely person named Allison Mitchell. Um, so I would suggest that you go onto their website and see if you can um, find an answer to that or send, send her or someone there a note. We are, um, we are the biggest city in the country with, with we have a 4% recycling rate in Indianapolis. 4%. We're the, um, people hear this from, we're, what, we're the 12th largest city in the country or something, and they just, their jaws drop. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully we will change that. Um, Indianapolis has a, um, a plan called Thrive, uh, which is their climate resilience, in, uh, environmental sustainability, and environmental equity plan. Um, and focusing on recycling is a, is a big element of that. Oh, wow. Who knew? Who knew, right? Well, you guys do now, and you can tell everybody. <laughs> how, uh, but, you know, a lot of people live in apartment buildings where recycling is not provided, um, and, they, and they don't have the option to, to, uh, to, to, to pay for it anyway and have it be convenient. So, and many workplaces, of course, don't recycle. Yeah. Janet, you gave us uh, links to um, an assessment that was conducted. I don't know who was conducted by your office about Indiana's attitudes about environmental um, justice or issues. And oh, I just, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. How do we rank? I, I'm sure there must be some ranking of states too. Are we, where do we rank? Um, you know, that's a good, that is a good question. And um, I, don't, I don't know that, that I have the answer to that off the top of my head. Um, there is a Yale. Um, has the you know, Yale University has a climate communication center where um, they do a tremendous amount of um, nationwide um, uh, opinion collecting about climate change. Mm -hmm. um, I'm putting in the chat room here the the link to um, uh, ERI's website um, and under tools and resources the tab there you can find something called the Hoosier Life Survey. Okay. Um, this is a survey that, that we just collected this year that, um, that does ask a lot of those questions. We just did a nice report on that sorted people by um, how they self-identified in terms of political affiliation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the, only, the only surprise in there, there are really not um, huge surprises in there, um, people who identify as liberal um, are more supportive of environmental programs and believe more strongly that climate change is going to affect us in bad ways. Um, but, but a majority of Republicans believe those things too. Um, but depending on whether you're a Republican or a Democrat actually affects your impression of whether it's getting hotter in Indiana or whether there are more floods. Mm. So um, I think that's fascinating because that's a matter of fact. You know, we, it is getting hotter in Indiana. There's, it's not a matter of opinion. It is. The temperature gauges say so. Um, so, uh, so that's interesting. And then I, I want to give you one more 
um, so, just so you can grab these and you don't have to get them later. Um, one more uh, link, which is to the, um, the Indiana Climate Change Impacts Assessment. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I was going to say that um, one of the first places you might look if you're interested in impacts on uh, women and minorities is, is in the, um, the uh, report on, on health, because um, that'll get, start, get, get you started on that. But here's the link for that. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to stop with the links. How can we reduce plastic in the world? Um, yeah, you know, that's sort of, um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about um, I'm plunging into to that. Um, we can make choices um, about what we buy. Um, and, um, you know, f from the, the simple thing of not taking plastic bags at, at stores. Although, again, here's another thing where, um, some stores were saying under COVID, you can't bring your, Trader Joe's was saying you cannot bring your own bags in anymore. Um, I don't know whether they're still doing that, but, um, uh, yeah, and. But you can ask them for paper. You can ask them for paper. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, 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 and you should do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and other choices that you make, um, uh, there are, and it goes the other way too. So um, uh, is it Ikea? Um, Ikea recently announced a couple of different lines of products that they make that where their raw material is ocean plastic. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Um, so, um, so we need it from both ends. You know, we can't, we, we can't, you and me taking, uh, not taking plastic bags is not, is not going to fix this. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, questions? I just want to um, share a, a personal perspective. I grew up in northeastern Ohio. I remember the Cuyahoga River catching on fire more than once. And um, we also lived right on Lake Erie, we went swimming every day. And um, this is just about attitude changes. What mm -hmm. we considered normal, if you can believe it, was that you had to have one swimming suit for the lake and one swimming suit for the country club. And you would never, ever exchange those because when you swam in the lake, which we did every day, there were so many oil spills, and these did not even make the news in those days, that the oil would turn to like globs of tar in the water. And so you would come out of the water with these globs of tar just stuck to you all over your body and you have to go in the garage and clean off with kerosene before you could even come in the house to take a shower. That was normal <laughs> in those days. So I'll be 69 this year. I think that would no longer be considered normal. So, um, and Lake Geary has kind of turned around. Um, so that's just, I mean, just in terms of a timeline for how long it takes for attitudes to change. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, you know, in my lifetime, that's happened. Well, and to be honest, I think one of the challenges we have is that we really have um, eliminated a lot of those really, really obvious sources of pollution. Mm -hmm. um, there, there isn't as much litter even, uh, although in some places there is. Um, the air pollution is not as visible uh, because we have technology on most of the big industry. But there, there is still, there are still toxic chemicals coming out of those smokestacks. Um, you just, you just don't see them because the soot gets pulled out through filters and stuff. Um, so whether it's CO2 or, or other sorts of toxic chemicals that um, affect our health in, in other ways. And, um, and water pollution also is not as visible as it was, although there's, you know, there, there's still pl plenty of it. Yeah, somebody else mentioned um, an experience with tar balls on the beach. Um, when, when I think it was Andrea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Marianne, do you had a question? Yeah, I was just going to say one encouraging thing is the wonderful clean air that's happened all over the world thanks to the pandemic and the lack of use of uh, cars and trucks and planes and things. I mean, look at Venice. They have fish going in the canals now that they haven't had for probably 100 years. Well, they weren't yeah. able to see them anyway. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, and our, our skies are definitely clearer here. I mean, I, I think the challenge there is that um, that that's that's nice, but nobody's 
nobody's glad that we are that the reason for it is that um, uh, thousands of people are getting sick and, and, and dying around the world. Um, but again, you know, we if we can if we can figure out how not to um, what they're saying now is that um, being resilient is not about bouncing back; it's about bouncing forward. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's recover in a way that helps us avoid the situations that we've been in that have that that have allowed. I mean, clearly, people were not prepared um, for this virus, and and yeah. um, let's hope that that we won't do that again. Mm -hmm. um, and, and um, at least what, one of the good things is that people can see, as you just said, Marianne, that when you don't have cars driving around so much, you, the, you don't have as much air pollution. Mm -hmm. and, and, and especially for people who have asthma or respiratory disease, it's not just a matter of are the skies clearer, it's how do I feel today? Mm -hmm. So Marianne is raising another point about what motivates people to listen and to change. And usually it, it is something highly visible and personal, a personal story, some really adverse situation, unfortunately. But so what we can do, I guess, is um, tell stories, as you were saying, to our politicians and policymakers, but we can also model in our own neighborhoods where we are new behaviors. I think you have to start somewhere and sometimes you can just start in your own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And talking with people. The, mm -hmm. the challenge of climate change, I have colleagues at IU who are really smart about, about personal psychology and what's, what motivates people and, and what's hard for them to focus on. And climate change, until pretty recently, um, was far away, mm -hmm. right? It was, it was islands out in the Pacific, mm -hmm. um, or it was polar bears. Um, which might have motivated some people, but would not motivate most people in, in the country who would never see a polar bear and would not be able to connect a polar bear meaningfully to their own experience. Um, or it was way in the future. Right. And we just know that as humans, it is harder for us uh, to think about and act for something that may happen 20, 30 years from now. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, we have to think about our children and our grandchildren and their children. I mean, you know. Climate change is real. Yes. Uh, there was a city in Siberia yesterday that had a temperature of over 100. I saw that. Siberia? Oh, my God. Staggering. Yeah. 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 Unbelievable. Every day you see a headline that, you know, yeah, the study just, says this was the hottest year ever or um, the you know, the most this, the most that. And, and if, you, if you remember that slide I showed with the temperature changes, that when, you, when, when people say the, last, the hottest years on record have all been in the last 10 years, you can see that on that, on that chart. They really have been. Mm -hmm. Well, you have given us some incredible resources and a lot of information for us to think about some more. And we're going to definitely want to have you back in conversation. And I'm sure we're going to have some more conversations with our groups and our networks. Uh, but I want to thank you again, Jen, for your very generous offering of information and resources for us. And I'm so glad you're part of the Women for Change now. <laughs> you are part of us now as well. And we're going to ask Denise uh, to come in and do something, and then the two of you together so we can have another conversation about this. Terrific. So, That'd be I great. just want to thank everybody for joining us today. And we will be doing this again, and we will let you know the dates and hope you'll sign up for for another educational session with us, and that you'll want to incorporate this in your already existing, what we call uh, CCC groups, uh, and talk about this as a topic and learn how to have conversations civilly without people screaming and yelling and being uncivil <laughs> to each other. Just like we are, we're very civil to each other. Uh, and please, if you, if, if you want, if you have any ideas for what we can do, let us know, let Haley know. And uh, if you're not a member, definitely join the Women for Change. This is the year, as you said, Janet, to really make a difference. So thank you Cheers. all. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Who, um,
Yeah, the mask. Who was wearing that wonderful mask? Dog in the car. That Ooh. was Julian, Julianne, Julian Clapp. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. When, okay. Where did we get this cap? Oh, what did it say? Boat like your life depends on it? Mm hmm I wonder where we can get that. I can probably yeah. look it up. Yeah. I'll email her and ask her and let you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this year, if there are just so many issues and um, my niece is really involved with, um, she was with the Buddha Judge campaign, and she'll soon be working on the Biden campaign. She did. Uh, she currently lives in Florida, but she did uh, the Andrew Gillum campaign. But she says really one of the most important issues for us right now really should be um, getting people registered to vote. Yep. And, you know, we've just got to do that as much as possible. So even when I've been out marching, I'm like, are you registered to vote? Are you registered to vote? <laughs> so we just need to remind, especially young people, you know, make sure they're registered and go vote, you know, this year. What, I what I've been doing, and I've been working on it during this meeting, is um, Indivisible has a template for a letter that has some space for you to make it personal, but most mm -hmm. of the writing is done. And they give you the names and addresses of people who are registered but did not vote in the last election. So okay, that's a great idea. Thank and, you. And then, and then we we mail it on our own paper and stamps, and it's at our expense. But they provide the names and addresses. Well, that'd be something good, you know, for each of us maybe to put on Facebook and just talk about the importance of this this year. And then even if you know. I could do five, maybe my friends could do five, you know, just get people to, you know, participate in it as much as possible this year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was great seeing everybody. It was good. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thanks, everybody.